Well, sometimes we hear of people who have developed a Messiah complex. They kind of believe that they're the answer to the world's problem. And this week I read about Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO and founder of Facebook, and the, the, the statements he was making that he's not happy with the outcome of the election, and he's not shy to tell anybody that he's not happy the way things turned out. Nor is he happy with the role that it appears his social media monster, Facebook, played in communicating information to people who ultimately voted for the candidate he opposed. In other words, he's not so happy that his tool helped elect Donald Trump. So he's kind of disturbed by all that. And he, a week ago, he gathered with a bunch of enthusiasts, Facebook enthusiasts in Chicago, and he said in that speech that he was changing the mission and the purpose of Facebook because he saw it was not going the way he wanted it to. And the mission and purpose of Facebook, he stated, was going to bring together uh, many people all over the world closer than they have been, implying in his speech that had Facebook done the job that he now wants it to do, that Donald Trump would not be the President of the United States. Very interesting. Uh, and uh, what's really eye-opening to me is that he said he wants face Facebook groups to play an important role that churches and little leagues used to perform in our society. So, Facebook to replace the church? I'm just taking his words at, at face value, what he's saying. In his speech he said, and I'm quoting, Americans are in need of something to unify their lives. It's so striking that for decades, membership in all kinds of groups has declined as much as one quarter. There's a lot of people who now need to find a sense of purpose and support somewhere else. Uh, not in church, but in Facebook. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Um, he said, we started a project to see if we could get better at suggesting groups that will be meaningful to you. We started building artificial intelligence to do this, and it works. In the first six months, we've helped 50% more people to join meaningful communities, that is, on Facebook, meaningful communities. His ultimate goal, he said, is to convince one billion users of Facebook to join communities on Facebook. <laughs> he said, if we can do this, it will not only turn around the whole decline in community membership we've seen for decades, it will start to strengthen our social fabric and bring our world closer together. <laughs> wow, what a, what a vision he has, right? Uh, so he's going to be using artificial intelligence, if I understand what he's saying, the software they develop to data mine every bit of information he can gain about you the patterns of what you purchase and uh, patterns of where you drive and uh, where you shop and what you wear and who you talk to and who you text. Take all this information that he can glean about you and then engineer a social group just for you to join, a community for you to be part of. Facebook, in other words, wants to choose your friends out of the two billion users that it has worldwide so you can be close to people in community, people you have never, ever met face to face. Isn't it interesting? It's turned around upside down. It's like you want to be in a community with people you've never met and don't see face to face and don't interact with face to face. That's what they are proposing. Well, uh, we've already heard many, many stories about Facebook's censorship, censorship of the political side of the spectrum that the founder and the, those who control Facebook do not like that, and they disagree with their censoring already. So perhaps their new motto at Facebook should be this. Friends, don't let friends vote for Trump. Let me be your friend. That's probably their new motto because that seems to be what their intention is. But there is something true in what Zuckerberg has said. There is a collapse taking place of solid relationships in America. People abandoning church, marriages and families breaking apart, and people choosing to isolate and to insulate themselves from deeper relationships. Robert Putnam, a researcher who spent 25 years, uh, published a groundbreaking book after his 25 years of research, and he called it Bowling Alone. 
He, <laughs> that's an interesting title, but he showed how people have become increasingly disconnected from family, disconnected from friends and neighbors, and even our civic structures that used to function well, we are also disconnecting from them. And he said that in his book, his idea is that there's a network of relationships that he terms social capital. I don't know if that's really the best term for it, but the fabric of connections in a society he sees in his research in America has plummeted, and the result impoverishes our lives and our communities. He did research with nearly a half a million people, interviewing them over 25 years, and he says that fewer of us sign petitions, fewer of us join organizations that meet face-to-face, and plenty of people on Facebook, but that doesn't meet face-to-face, and, and he says, few of us, fewer of us know our neighbors and meet with friends less frequently and socialize with even our family members less often, and he said the telling thing for him was that more people today are bowling alone. It used to be that people bowled, they joined a league, and today most people are not joining leagues. That seems to be the pattern, and he showed changes in work and family structure, age, suburban life, television and especially computers, women's roles and the changing factors there, all of these have contributed to a decline in the connectedness in the interpersonal relationships in America. He showed that, showed that attending club meetings over the 25 years, there's a 58% decline in that. Family dinners, 43% less. Uh, having friends over, 35% drop. And he shows all this that we are less strong in terms of our relationships as a society than we were 25 years ago. Others have added to that research that he uh, did and, and published. And one researcher writes, probably the most surprising finding is that people with the good networks actually live longer. And that's been research. He uh, said the mechanisms are not fully understood, but the link between networks and longevity appears to be caused. Both behavioral and biological changes take place. For example, it's been widely observed that frequent attendance at religious surfaces reduces mortality. It actually does. They've, they've studied this. This is partly due, of course, to improve health practices. A person may stop smoking or uh, reduce drinking or alcohol consumption, or they stay married rather than getting divorced and these sort of things. But it's also due, he said, this researcher, to the meaning to life that Christianity, he says religion, I'll say Christianity gives. Lisa Berkman, uh, who's at the Harvard Health and, uh, what's it called, the Behavioral Health School of Public Health, she mapped the social networks and lifestyles and health behaviors of 7,000 residents in Alameda County, California, over a nine-year period. And she discovered that isolated people were three times as likely to die during the nine years she studied than those who were well-connected. It makes a very big difference what our relationships are and the depth of those relationships. And so that leads me to add this question to the mix. Does Facebook contribute to actually strengthening people's relationships with one another? <laughs> I think not. I think it further distances them if they don't already have those strong connections with uh, one another. There's been some conflicting studies about Facebook and other social media, whether it's actually beneficial. But I think one researcher, James Coleman, got it right. He said, social capital, these connections, flourish when people are following the rules of society. That is, there's accepted standard of right behavior and wrong behavior, and when people are following the rules of society, he said, people that live their life this way feel that there are norms in society to which they all adhere. Coleman says that when people live in this way, and the benefits from this type of what he calls social capital, individuals in the society are able to rest assured that their belongings and their family will be safe. And that struck a chord with me. Yes, that's it. You see, this is how it all ties together. A society only functions so long as there is a law and a series of laws that everyone agrees to, and most everyone follows those laws in their own life, even if no one is watching them. How about laws like, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal or lie or covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. If the vast majority of people believe that's not only the law, they believe it's good and right, and they follow that, then you will be safe 
in such a society, and your possessions and your family will be safe. I was reading a while ago about the work of, a long-term work of a missionary. I believe it was in a South American country. And when, when they began their ministry in that South American country, they were kind of surprised that every time they got on board a bus or a train or, or any other form of transportation, everybody was bringing their chickens and their goats, you know, it was kind of like a rolling zoo, and it's like, why do people do this, and didn't understand what this was all about, but later discovered that the reason people did that is that was their wealth. Most of the average people in that culture didn't have money in the bank, but they had an animal or two animals, and their animals were their wealth. And they brought their wealth with them when they left their home because they knew if they left their wealth at home, somebody would steal it. That the society had not adopted God's law that says, thou shalt not steal. But he noticed over a decade or two decades of ministry as the gospel began to transform individual lives and, and as, as the church began to grow and make a bigger and bigger impact, over several decades, less and less people brought their wealth with them when they rode on public transportation. Why? Because as Christians learned the law of God, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's chicken or thy neighbor's goat or whatever belongs to thy neighbor, and thou shalt not steal thy neighbor's chicken, that more and more people were obeying God's law, and even the non-Christians got the picture. My property is safe because my neighbors are Christians. They're not going to steal that which belongs to me. When the people live this way, they benefit from what these researchers are calling social capital. And only the church of Jesus Christ can accomplish, through the power of God's Spirit, accomplish that transformation in people's lives that results in a transformation of the culture. Facebook can't accomplish that. No, not at all. If you have your Bible, turn to Titus chapter 3 and verse 10. Because our calling to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to walk in obedience to all that Christ has commanded and all that Christ has called us to do, is the thing that brings about a civil society in which safety for your person, your property, for your family is true. Look at what Titus chapter 3 and verse 10 and 11 say about keeping the peace in the kingdom of God. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Wow, this is tough language. This is tough love. This is loving discipline that is being urged on Titus for the churches that he was working with in the island of Crete. I think the weakness that we see in our land today is in large part due to the fact that so many people and so many so-called churches do not believe in truly making disciples. They're unwilling to show the tough love being spoken of here in God's Word, to discipline the wayward. To better understand what uh, Titus is being instructed to do here, keep your finger there. Let's turn to Matthew 18 because Jesus said something rather similar but at a different level than, uh, than Titus does. This is Matthew 18. And picking up at verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 15. And as we do this, let's compare in our minds what we just read in Titus 3. Let's compare and contrast what Jesus says here in Matthew 18 and verse 15. Jesus says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, then thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then... Take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen uh, man and a publican, that is a tax collector. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus' instructions, if we contrast it, what we were told in Titus 3, is if your brother sins against you, 
It's a different circumstance. We're going to see a different setting, a different issue than it is in Titus 3. But if your brother sins against you, this is a different set of commands than rejecting a heretic, a divisive man that, that Titus 3 speaks of. And notice the reason, uh, the, the reason, I believe, for the difference is that the protection of the body of Christ in Titus 3 sets a higher standard. We'll go back to Titus 3 in a minute, but let's look at what Jesus is saying here, a four-step process that he is instructing us in. That is, if your brother sins against you, there's an offense that has taken place. First, you must, on your own, without anyone else, as part of that conversation, lovingly confront your brother or sister with that uh, sin. And the sole aim being to restore that relationship, to uh, lead to a restoration that will be based upon repentance. That they have sinned against you, they repent of that sin, they recognize their fault and ask forgiveness. Now, if they refuse to do that, if they refuse to repent or recognize their fault, only then must you take another, one or two, with you to go to your brother or your sister as a small group of two or three, and again, lovingly to confront them. Again, the purpose is always to bring about repentance and to bring about reconciliation of that relationship. It's never to retaliate against them or somehow uh, browbeat them. It's rather to restore them uh, to a proper relationship uh, with you. But if the two or three, Jesus says, cannot accomplish that ministry of reconciliation and restoration, then they are to tell it to the church. And this process would involve the leadership of the church, which they may have to do some investigative work before they can present the issue. But once they understand the issue, they are to present it before the members of the body of Christ. And then the goal, again, is reconciliation, repentance, and restoration of the brother. The whole body of Christ is, at this point, involved in that process of seeking to bring about reconciliation, restoration, and repentance. But if they refuse to be reconciled, uh, even as the whole church seeks to minister to them, at some point then a sad decision is reached. And that decision Jesus defines as treating this person as a non-Christian. This, when we think of how we treat a non-Christian, what do we do? We love them. We seek to share Christ with them. We don't ignore them, but uh, we desire every opportunity we have with them to share Christ with them, to lead them to saving faith in Christ. That's how we are to treat a non-Christian. Now, we know today this is very difficult to do in the body of Christ in America. Why? It's because people in America who label themselves Christians do not want to be held accountable they do not want to be disciplined in the way that Jesus describes here in Matthew 18. Yet, this is what Jesus calls upon us to do in making disciples. There's an interesting trend if you look over the past two decades in America. It's reflected in this move away from count accountability, I believe. Church attendance as a whole over the past two decades in America is on slow decline. But as it's on a slow decline, there are certain churches that are growing very rapidly. And those are the mega churches. They're growing by leaps and bounds. And so while overall the attendance has declined, there are certain churches that are getting larger and larger and larger, which tells us what is happening. That some people are choosing to leave the church that they're in and go to the mega church. Perhaps that's the entertainment draw that uh, draws them in, which means they're focused not on worshiping the Lord, but being, on being entertained in that environment. But a more important thing even than that is I believe that they're uh, desiring to be in a larger congregation like that because you can be an anonymous person in a mega church. Nobody knows you're there. You're there one week or not there the next. It's, you're anonymous. There's no accountability involved. And certainly if there's no accountability involved, there's no way that what Jesus describes here in Matthew 18 can ever take place. There can be no church discipline in such a setting. And there are obviously some of those churches that recognize this problem and try to create accountability groups with, with small groups. But the majority of people that attend those churches do not come to those groups. They're going to those churches for the purpose of avoiding accountability, avoiding discipline. They want to be Christians without being a disciple. Because a disciple, by definition, is one who is 
Discipline, self-disciplined or disciplined by the body as well. That's by definition. And so they want to be Christians but not disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, it's interesting when you look at the scriptures, the word Christian was invented by the non-Christians to describe Christians. The Christians always referred to themselves as disciples or as brothers. They didn't refer to themselves as Christians. That's how the pagans referred to them. And look at verse 20 here. Notice what Jesus says. For where two or three are gathered together in my name... There I am in the midst of them. I believe this verse is most often lifted out of its context. Look at the surrounding context. It's talking about discipline. And when discipline is done, Jesus is there in the midst of that discipline. In other words, this is uh, Jesus saying that discipline is part and parcel of what it means to be a disciple and what it means to be a church. Jesus is there when the discipline is taking place. So I believe this verse is often lifted out of context. Say, hey, wherever two or three believers gather together, there Christ is. Well, not exactly. Christ is there if it is a church that practices church disciplines, that follows the prescription that Jesus gives to us here. And it's not only in this passage that Jesus talks about discipline. We won't take time to look at it, but if you read the second and third chapter of the book of Revelation, it's seven letters that Jesus writes to seven churches, and there's only one of those seven churches that didn't get rebuked for its sins. All the other churches were urged to repent of their sin. Jesus said, I will come unto thee quickly. Uh, Repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Jesus is saying to those churches, if you don't get your act together and do what's right, I'm going to come and take the light out of your church. The light of the gospel, the light of God's truth is going to be removed from that church, hollowing it out, making it an empty shell, a church in name only, not a true church. You see, church discipline is mandatory, as Jesus defines it there in Matthew 18. You could say that there's no church government or actually there's no true church without church discipline being part and parcel of that. As Christian sins against another, there is a process by which that sin is to be dealt with. Let's turn back to Titus chapter 3 and and contrast what we just read of Jesus' description of what is to take place when your brother sins against you and, and look at this contrast and answer the question, why the difference? There was a four-step process that Jesus gave to us in Matthew 18. Here in Titus uh, 3 in verse 10, there's really just a two-step process. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Why a two-step process? Just two admonitions and a final decision in contrast to Matthew 18, a four-step process? It's because the damage done to the body of Christ by a heretic is so much greater that they must be dealt with much more swiftly just to remind us of the destruction that takes place when a heretic enters the body and begins their destructive work I'm going to share with you what I shared with the children in Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace Endeavoring, that is, to make haste, to be zealous, uh, to be diligent. And, and so it, it's, it involves hard work here, endeavoring. And the work, it is of the Holy Spirit. His work is to create a unity among the disciples of Jesus Christ. His work is to bind them together in the bond of peace. In other words, the normal life of the church is one of unity, and it's unity produced by the Holy Spirit and His work in us. What is that bond of peace? Well, when we understand the word peace, we often just think of the cessation of the hostilities. Two enemies stop throwing stones at each other, and that's peace. No, no, no. It's not the biblical concept of peace, not in the New Testament, the Greek term arene, or the Old Testament term shalom. It was much more than a cessation of hostility. Shalom was God's word for a wholeness and a goodness and a total satisfaction of life that, that uh, was shalom. It was what Jesus promised. He said, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That abundant life is the shalom, that gift of the well-being, the establishment of lasting righteousness and goodness, that safe and sound and healthy and perfect and complete, this sense of well-being and harmony, both a harmony within the person, peace within, 
but also peace without the person. That is, in their relationship with fellow disciples, there is also harmony, completeness, wholeness, peace, health. All of these things are referred to by the term shalom, the absence of discord, the state of uh, calm without any anxiety. And this is the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in the body of Christ on an ongoing basis. And if we're participating with that work, we are encouraging, we are endeavoring to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so Scripture exhorts us to be part of establishing that. And so what a heretic does in the body of Christ, what it does in the community, is essentially break that bond of peace between Christians in the body of Christ. There are two ways a heretic will do that. First, we'll look at this first, is the area of sound doctrine. When they attack what the Scriptures actually say, when they refute and reject what the Scriptures say, that's sound doctrine being rejected. The second is the application of the teaching of sound doctrine. That is obedience to the commands of Christ. A heretic may deny what Christ actually says, or the heretic may deny obeying the commands of Christ and obeying his, his thing. So let's look at the first. It's rejection of orthodoxy, that is what we believe, denying the essential Christian doctrines, things such as the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ or the Trinity or the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross for our sins or the fact that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone and so on. So the heretic not only disbelieves these sound doctrines that are taught in God's Word, they go about trying to persuade others to disbelieve them as well. What they're doing is actually the work of Satan in the body of Christ, destroying the faith of disciples, uh, and, and it, it would be parallel to, if you think of your physical body, if some parts of your physical body, some cells in your physical body begin destroying your body, they would be like a heretic. What do we call that when your cells begin to destroy you? We call it cancer, right? We know that every cell in our body is designed by God to accomplish certain functions in our body. Every cell in our body, with the exception of our brain cells, at some point dies and has to be replaced. But God designed our cells such that before they die, they multiply, that is, they reproduce themselves in another cell to accomplish the same functions as the cell that's about to die. So before it dies, it replaces itself. Let's say it's a mother cell and a daughter cell. We could look at it that way. Well, the cancer cell is a daughter cell that when it is reproduced, malfunctions. And it no longer does what it was designed to do. It's an aberrant cell. Now, by the way, we have lots of those cells in our 300, uh, 37 trillion cells in our body. There's lots of these aberrant cells there. But the problem becomes identified as cancer when the cells that are aberrant begin to multiply rapidly. The daughter cells produce other daughter cells that, again, do not do the function they were designed to do. And in a sense, they're like a parasite. They're taking resources from the body, and they're multiplying, and the thing they're multiplying isn't helping the health of the body at all. It's not doing what it was designed to do, not contributing to the proper function of the body at all. Instead, it's totally focused on itself, and that is its desire and plan to just reproduce more of its cells. And ultimately, of course, the more of those cancer cells, the more the person who is the host is moving towards death. They reproduce themselves, taking up the precious resources, and then begin crowding out the good cells, the cells that are properly functioning the way God designed them. And this is what a heretic does in the body of Christ. They infect other disciples with false doctrine and deadly heresy, just like cancer. And so it is they must be cut out of the body of Christ, which is what Paul tells us here in Titus 3, that you are to reject the heretic after the first and second admonition. And that's because these doctrinal heresies are not minor issues. You know, if someone rejects the deity of Christ and begins to teach others to reject the deity of Christ, they themselves are no longer Christians, and they're leading other people down that broad road to hell. So it is with all the other essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Now, we're living in a time where this practice of rejecting heretics in the church of, self, of Jesus Christ, this doctrine is itself being rejected. Think of that. 
It'd be like the cancer cells rising up and convincing the brain cells of the person who has cancer not to do anything about the cancer, saying, oh, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. Things are going to go well for you. And all the while, the cancer cells know that we're destroying this body, but we've pers persuaded the brain not to do anything about this deadly cancer. Don't worry. Everything is just fine. And there are many examples I could cite today of people who doctrinally have adopted heresy, and yet they remain in the body of Christ at large and are making a de de devastating and dastardly destruction to the body of Christ. I will just mention one, and I mention this name because you need to know when people have become heretical. He is the author of a Bible paraphrase, The Message, a Bible paraphrase many people have read and, and respected. Eugene Peterson said recently that he not only approved of sodomite unmarriage, but that he would be glad to officiate at any such ceremony. I was shocked when I heard this. I had respect for this man up to this point in time. And there was pushback. That is, he was rebuked by so many people, evidently, that he changed his position, but only slightly. This week he said his position is that he would not conduct uh, or officiate at a sodomite on marriage ceremony uh, uh, that was not wise to do. But he did not repent of his previous position that basically said sodomy's okay. It's like, what? I would respect him as repenting and not label him as a heretic if he went back to the biblical standard, but he did not. He went partway just because he, he was getting some pushback from people, a very weak response, not repudiating his prior statement and his approval of sodomy. It's wrong. So I name his name here in the pulpit to warn the saints that the cancer cell, Eugene Peterson, is in the body of Christ. Beware of his teaching. He may teach some things that are true, but beware there may be error that he harbors because he's harboring a major error which he has not repented of. We must be on guard against false doctrine emanating even from those teachers who have received renown and notoriety and respect in the body of Christ. But some might say, David, wait a minute, uh, you're not doing a Matthew 18 here. You haven't gone to him one-to-one -one and, and you know, rebuked him to try to lead him to repentance. Note the difference here. The difference is he has not sinned against me personally. If he had done something against me, it would be appropriate for me to go to him one-to-one. -one. Instead, he has, as a heretic, infected the body of Christ. He has been rebuked, and his rebuke has not led to repentance. And so what Scripture tells us in Titus 3 is when the heretic, someone teaching and leading in the body of Christ, is doing this damaging, destructive work, they are to be rejected. So it's a different process. Matthew 18 deals with a one-to-one, -one, a personal sin against you. Titus 3 talks about what's happening in terms of the teaching in the body of Christ at large as a whole. If your brother trespass against thee, go tell him, but this is not a brother trespassing. This is a leader in the body of Christ uh, becoming a heretic, rejecting the sound doctrine of God's word in an entirely uh, different situation. The heretic in the body is damaging the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ from within. But it's not just orthodoxy, what they teach that can be damaging. We also need to see that a, a heretic can do equal damage in doing rejection of orthopraxy, probably a term you haven't heard. Orthodoxy is what you believe, orthopraxy is what you do, your obedience to the law of God. And rejecting orthopraxy means that you reject obedience to the law of God. That you tell people, go ahead and disobey God's law, it's fine, and that's essentially what Peterson is doing. Say, sodomy, that's not a problem anymore, go ahead and do whatever you like. They tell you that the law of God does not matter anymore, that the moral law of God is no longer binding, that we are supposedly in an age of grace, and therefore, you know, these things no longer matter. You can violate God's law, and uh, there's wide, sec sec wide acceptance today of these attitudes of violating God's law and still calling yourself a Christian. What I think has happened is Christianity, true Christianity has been rejected, and what has been put in its place is humanism. Humanism basically says the purpose and meaning of life is not to worship God and serve Him. The purpose and meaning of life is the happiness of human beings as defined by human beings themselves. 
God in His Word tells us what it means to live the blessed life, not the happy life, the blessed life, and that's composed of obedience to the commands of Christ. If you obey the commands of Christ, you live the blessed life. Perhaps those like Peterson have gone soft on sodomy because they've actually rejected true Christianity and adopted humanism instead of biblical Christianity. And if they believe humanism to be true, then what human beings claim makes them happy. That's the bottom line in every issue of life. You know the old saying in the 60s, if it feels good, do it. If it makes you happy, go right ahead. That's the philosophy they have adopted, which is interesting why the sodomites stole the world word and perverted the word gay. Gay used to mean happy, right? Well, they claim human happiness is what it's all about, and that's why they uh, hijack that word. The result of that, however, is the rejection of the law of God, discarded by the latest fads that come along. And the latest fads and adapting and accommodating those latest fads become more important than preaching the whole counsel of God, even where the counsel of God is uncomfortable in our day. And so heretics may be rejecting orthodoxy, or they may be rejecting orthopraxy, or they may be involved in rejecting both of those. And Titus is commanded, and we are commanded as well, in a ministry of admonition that has put them in mind, remind them of what the Word of God says one time, and then if they do not repent, remind them a second time, and if they do not repent of their heresy, then you need to reject them from the body of Christ. Recognize them and identify them as heretics to be outside the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is strong and this is powerful because heretics destroy the unity of the body of Christ from within as an enemy within. Looking back at uh, Titus 3, look at verse 11 where the character again of the heretic is clearly identified three specific things. Knowing this, that he, that is the heretic, that is such is subverted, there's the first, and sinneth, the second, being condemned of himself. Three things that the heretic is uh, condemned for. The first is that they are twisted or perverted, some translations say. It's basically the word is to turn something inside out. You've made it the opposite of what it should be. You've uh, perverted it, uh, you have distorted it, you've changed it for the worse. The second is that they are sinning, and they're sinning willfully. That is, they're not ignorant of God's law. They know what God's law, they know what God's word says, and they're choosing to violate God's word, violate God's law. And thirdly, they're self-condemned. That is, while they preach condemnation of others, they themselves are doing the same things that they condemn others for, which is the definition of what? A hypocrite. Think of what God's attitude is towards the heretic, who disturbs the peace of the body of Jesus Christ. Turn to Proverbs, if you would, chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 and uh, verse uh, uh, 16 and following tells us what God uh, thinks of these. This is Proverbs 6 and verse uh, 16. It begins by saying that uh, these six, six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. So he's going to give us a list of seven. The first six are things that God hates. The last one, the seventh, God not only hates it, God calls it an abomination. Here's the seven. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. So there's the six things that God hates, and the seventh he hates and he calls an abomination, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Wow, contrast that list. Those who shed innocent blood, God hates that, but one who sows discord among the brethren, God says that is an abomination, something he detests. That's how much God values the unity of the body of Christ in the bond of peace that the Holy Spirit himself is actively cultivating. Years ago, I remember Aesop, in one of his fables, uh, talks about three bulls that... Uh, fed together in a field, and they were safe because they remained together and with great peace and safety. But there was a lion who wanted to eat each of those bulls, and he watched them with the hope of making prey of them. But he recognized that he could not take all three of those bulls down, that they could defend themselves together. And so he had to think 
carefully about how to do this. So he began secretly to spread evil and slanderous rumors about each of the bulls to different uh, sources that ultimately came to those bulls, and they began to be jealous of one another. They began to distrust one another, and they began to avoid each other so that they began grazing apart from each other. And feeding alone, this gave the lion the opportunity he was looking for. He fell on each of them singly and devoured them entirely. The Bible tells us that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so it's true for God's people as well. United, we stand. Divided, we fall to the enemy. And so the heretic is so dangerous because he destroys the unity of the body of Christ by his heresy, rejection of orthodoxy, or his rejection of orthopraxy, obedience to God's law. We're commanded by the word of God to preserve the unity of the body of Christ, which is vitally important to the advance of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a wealthy landowner in South India who had three sons who were always fighting with one another and vying for power and wealth and all the rest of that. So on his deathbed, he recognized the problem and, and decided before he died, he would do something about it. He divided his property equally among them, and he called them to bring some sticks to him. They brought him a group of sticks, and he said, tie these sticks together tightly. And then he handed that bundle to the oldest son and said, break these sticks in half. He's ramming on his, he could not break that bundle of sticks, no matter how hard he tried. He asked his second son, do the same. He could not. Third son, do the same. He could not. Then he said to the oldest son, untie that bundle of sticks and break them one by one. And very easily, the son was able to break that until there was a whole pile of those broken sticks uh, before their father. And he taught them this lesson, that together they would have strength. But if they broke apart, and if they separated, they would be easily broken just as those sticks were broken. This is true for you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the body of Christ, we need one another. We need the strength of one another. Back in 1741, there were a group of very uh, devout Christians, the Moravians, who were very engaged in missionary work, taking the gospel to where it had not been preached before. But there was a dispute that arose among the Moravian brethren and this dispute caused them to have a meeting called by Count Zinzendorf to resolve the differing views on the subject of controversy that had arisen among them. The leaders came together at the appointed time, some from very great distances to the place where it was to be held. And when they arrived on that appointed day, each of them was prepared to argue their point, to convince the others that they were correct and receive the support confident that they would win uh, the day. But they arrived in the middle of the week and, and wisely Count Zinzendorf said that they should spend time over the word of God and in prayer before talking at all about the differences among them. He suggested they read the epistle of 1 John. And day after day they read and meditated and discussed what that epistle meant and what it said. And the emphasis in 1 John is the love for the brethren. Beloved, love one another. John continues to call them beloved throughout that entire epistle. And they agreed that they would do this until Monday, the first day of the week. Sunday arrived, and they gathered together as a church, and they broke bread. They had the Lord's Supper together and heard from the Scripture reminding them that they were one body, and having that illustrated to them before as they took the Lord's Supper, that they, they were one body in the Lord. All of this was very salutary for them, because on Monday morning when they commenced to examine the issues that had divided them up to this point, the issues on which they differed, their differences and their disputes quickly were settled. Each bowed to the Word of God, thus each helped to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace because they recognized these things that they disagreed were small compared to the unity of the body that Christ has called them to. The Church of Jesus Christ is clearly called to have tough love, discipline, among its members, loving those members whose sins need to be gently and lovingly confronted, bringing reconciliation, bringing restoration, but dealing with heretics firmly and quickly to prevent the cancerous influence they might have on the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. No church government means really that there is no church at all without church discipline being part of that. Well, the hope of the world 
is not Mark Zuckerberg, if you had to guess that. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, indeed. And the hope for mankind is not Facebook. No, it cannot do anything of any significance. It is the true church of Jesus Christ. Let us be that church.